nowadays everybody can edit. When I started out, you had to actually be fortunate enough to go to film school or own some equipment to edit or be working on a movie. Now everybody's got a camera in their phone and everybody's got editing software. So people, if you want to edit, you can do it. Just do it now. Welcome back to Famous Editors. Today I'm going to be talking to one of the most famous Hollywood editors, Mark Helfrich who's cut over 50 Hollywood features in his career, including the Jumanji films, Predator. He's currently editing the new Dwayne Johnson film. In this conversation, Mark talks about starting his career with less than $600 in his pocket, crashing on a friend's couch, when a series of persistent phone calls and a lie about owning a van gets his foot in the door to what becomes one of the most prolific and successful editing careers in Hollywood working with the likes of Roger Corman, Paul Verhoeven, and countless other iconic American directors. I think you're going to enjoy this. Hi, Nick. Um, my first opportunity, uh, well, my first job, let's go back to that. My first job when I was 15 was working in a movie theater in Springfield, Virginia. So uh, I got the movie bug really early. And seeing movies over and over again in a theater made me really curious as to how they were made. So I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker about that time. And uh, went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for a couple years, majoring in film. And after two years, I took a year off to come to Hollywood to see if I could make it in Hollywood, see if it was for me. And in that year that I took off, I was fortunate enough to work on two movies for Roger Corman's New World Pictures. Uh, my first movie was Rock and Roll High School. I was a PA on that, and then I ended up being another assistant editor on that same film. So I befriended the editors, and I ended up in the editing room. I didn't know that that's where I would end up, but since I did, I found it fascinating. This was where the real work was done. So I just fell in love with editing, and I was fortunate enough then to just move on from editing, from assistant editing to editing. So for people who don't know who Roger Corman is, he was this like B-movie producer who was incredibly prolific, produced hundreds of films in his career, and was very much a businessman. He knew how to make money from films that were not expensive to produce, and he knew how to do them very, very quickly. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, he wrote a book and he said, I made 100 films and, and never lost a penny. I mean, he was very cheap. And everybody who worked with him really learned how to work in film because you had to do. You weren't getting paid to do it, but you had the opportunity to do it. So it was fantastic. Uh, everybody, and there's so many famous people who ended up out of the Corman camp because they learned on the job and you were forced to. And you really want to do a good job when you're starting out. So you try your hardest and, and then hopefully make it. So what, what were those two films that you worked on with him, and, and how did you get that introduction? Rock and Roll High School was the first one with the Ramones, and I just got it out of the blue. I mean, I, there's a long story on how I got it, but essentially uh, I looked at Variety, Daily Variety, which I didn't even know existed until I moved to Hollywood, and it said Films in the Future, and I looked and saw, oh, Films in the Future, That's I want to work in film, and these are the films that are going to be made in the future. So I saw that uh, John Landis was doing a film at Paramount and I knew he'd worked with the Zuckers who went to Madison, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison where I went. So I said, I have a connection there. Okay, I'll call John Landis and I'll get on his film. So I called John Landis at Paramount. Uh, luckily, uh, he wasn't doing anything at the time and I actually got through to him. And he, we talked for about 15 minutes and he said, I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs and PAs, but you really ought to call Roger Corman's New World Pictures. And I'm writing down Roger Corman's New World Pictures. Okay, so I called New World and I asked to talk to Roger and uh, he wasn't there. And then I called the, the next day and you know he wasn't there again. He wasn't available. And I called a third time and the secretary said, what's this in regards to? And I said, 
his next film. And she said, you mean Rock and Roll High School? And I said, yes. She said, well, the production number is this. And I wrote down the production number and I called that. And Alan Arkish, the director, answered the phone. And I said, hi, I'm Mark Helfrich. And, uh, and John Landis told me I should call. And he said, he did. Well, then you should come down here. So I, <laughs> I got on a bus and I went down. Uh, I didn't own a car or anything, but I was sleeping on a friend's couch and across the street from me, there was a van for sale for $600. And I, that's about how much I had in my pocket uh, when I moved out here. And the, product, the producer on Rock and Roll High School said, uh, his first question was, do you have a car? And I said, no, I have a van. I just lied. And he said, you have a van? You're hired. So I got back on the bus hoping that van was still available and I bought it for $600 and that's how I broke into the business. And then what? So, so uh, what was working on that film and then the next film like? So because of that, uh, I was the guy who took the film to the lab and then brought the work print to the uh, editing room. That's how I befriended the other assistant and, and the editors. And that after production wrapped, I just stayed on in the editing room unpaid for a while until I asked for some money um, and became an assistant editor. And then as soon as that film was done, there was another movie that Roger was doing. It was called Lady in Red. And the same editor, Larry Bach, was editing that. So Larry hired me as his assistant for that movie. Did you know uh, going into that experience that you wanted to be an editor? Or were you open to uh, seeing these different roles? No, I, I didn't know. I just wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm. I, you know, I've always wanted to direct. And, uh, but I found editing is just as powerful as directing. It really is the final rewrite, you know, as they say. So, uh, no, I didn't know I wanted to, but I, I fell in love with it after being in the editing room and seeing how, you know, how it's all put together and you can be so creative. So uh, it took me a long time, and I still don't fully understand the difference between uh, an assistant editor and, and an editor. What is the role of the AE on a film? The assistant editor basically organizes everything, everything that's coming in, all the, the picture and the sound, for the editor to cut. I mean, that's the simplest explanation, but they do so much more. I'm so dependent on, on my assistants. I couldn't do anything without them. Uh, they're technical. They know, they know all the stuff for the Avid, for importing, exporting, everything, stuff that I don't have the time to deal with, they deal with. And in addition, most assistants want to graduate into being an editor. I like to let them cut as much as they want on the film. Even if we cut the same scene, you can combine the best from both because it's so collaborative. Uh, no, no two people will edit a scene the same way. And they might think of some other idea that I couldn't think of and vice versa and, and one's better than the other, one's funnier than the other, one's more effective than the other. You just use the best ones then. And so after working with Roger Corman, what was next? Then I went back to Madison, Wisconsin and graduated. Um, not because I needed to, it's just because my dad was in education and I thought I'd get my degree for, for him. So I did. Uh, so that was, and during those two years, I, you know, made student films and did all other things. I, I was a projectionist for the film society there. And uh, the university was a great place to get film history. The Madison campus had something like 20 film societies back then. So on any given night, you could see 15 movies. That was the only way to see old movies back then. So it was fantastic. Uh, and I was also a projectionist. So I would watch films over and over again. It was um, a real education. And, you know, I got to see all the classics and all really uh, opened my eyes to appreciation of foreign films. And then I must have seen almost all the Hitchcock films and Bunuel and Truffaut and Herzog, everything. A lot of my film appreciation came from those years in Madison. So you came back to Hollywood after that? Then I came back and um, I lived with the other assistant from Rock and Roll High School, Kent Beta. We, I was in his apartment for a while and went to work on another 
uh, Roger Corman movie as a, a sound editor. Slumber Party Massacre, I think it was. <laughs> and then uh, after that, I did one more assistant editing job at Canon Films for Last American Virgin. And Canon was a company run by Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, and they made a ton of movies. A lot of really bad movies, but a lot of movies. So I got the opportunity to edit there for the first time. And the first film that I edited was uh, Revenge of the Ninja. I was an assistant on Last American Virgin. I said, you know, I, I can edit. Give me a film to edit. And they actually did, so... That's when I graduated editing. And how did that go? Were you confident that you were going to do a good job or were you... Uh... I felt, yeah, I, I felt very confident. I was really confident back then. I mean, even on the first film that I worked on, uh, Rock and Roll High School, Kent and I edited the trailer for the movie. That's great. I know today most trailers are cut by, you know, trailer studios. Uh, how many times have you actually cut trailers for your own films? Uh, for my own film, never, never. In fact, I, I cut a lot of trailers back then, but it's always for, you know, films for canon. Okay. Because, yeah, now there's trailer houses and multiple trailer houses on any given movie that I'm editing. The, the studio hires many vendors to try to come up with the best trailer. Yeah, what is that like watching a movie that you've just spent so many months with that you've really shaped the story for in post, seeing some other editor interpret that entire film in this you know, two and a half minute trailer. Oh, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's great. You know, you say, oh, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times uh, those trailer editors will have a cut that's so effective that the director goes, oh, we got to put that in the movie. So oh, wow. We end up taking something from the trailer and, integrating it into a movie or sometimes it's a joke that we thought was eh, it wasn't so good but it ends up being in the trailer and it tests through the roof so we go okay all right let's put it in the movie then because they test those trailers endlessly now they it's a science they want they want the best way to sell their movie yeah yeah i don't i don't even know the mechanics of it they it might be a small audience or it might be a large audience but but they've got numbers, detailed numbers about, you know, this, this line tests through the roof, this one's so-so, this one's great. And they want everything to work. That's why trailers sometimes are better than the movies. Yeah. <laughs> because everything works in the trailer. It's a common thing. Yeah. Um, how often do you feel that they give away too much in the trailer, too much of the story? I used to think that a lot. Uh, and I still think they give away, sometimes they give away too much, but then... The, the purpose of a trailer is to get people in the seats to pay for the movie. And if they like the trailer, they come see the movie, regardless of whether it was given away in the trailer. So it ultimately doesn't matter. But yeah, I'm, the filmmaker in me hates something to be given away like that. But if it really plays and it causes them to buy a ticket, then it's successful and then it's a win. How did Predator come to be? Uh, you mean, how did I get the job? Or Yeah, how did you um, get on editing that? I, I actually interviewed, was interviewed for that. I was working another Joel Silver production. Um, actually, my friend Mark Goldblatt was editing Commando on the first time I worked on a movie in Rock and Roll High School. He was right down the hall. And then we ended up working together on Rambo. And then... He asked me to join him on Commando, and I did, but I wasn't in the union. So I worked for one day on Commando, and then I was busted by Fox, and I couldn't take the job because I wasn't in the, the union. So in the interim, I was working at a commercial house and that went union, so I became a union editor. And then I was able to join Mark on another Fox movie, another Joel Silver movie, and that was Jumpin' Jack Flash. And after I finished that, Joel said he had another movie coming up called Predator. Actually, it was called Hunter at the time. I met uh, the director and he hired me for Hunter, 
which turned into The Predator, which turned into Predator by the time it was released. Interesting. Uh, and, and what was that experience like? What were those dailies like? Uh, they shot down in Mexico, so I went down there a, a few times. But uh, the footage was great. I mean, it looked fantastic, and it was, and we developed the invisibility look of of the predator before production began. We were doing tests with. This was all done on film. This was there's nothing digital about it. It was you know layers and layers of of opticals they were called there um, to try to come up with a really cool invisibility effect, which we did, and um, you know like and. During editing, I came up with the, the eye flashes to magnify his vision. And it was all made up in the editing room and, and on film. So I thought it was a, a lot of fun. It was great. It's a classic. How long will you work uh, on a movie typically? What's the timeline? And, and at what point is it uh, while production is still happening often? Or is it, is it always after rep? You, actually, you start work when they start shooting. Nowadays, I might be uh, hired a little earlier to work on pre-visualization if it's a big effects heavy movie. But um, the editor starts when they start shooting and you're editing as they shoot. Then as soon as shooting wraps, which takes about three months, generally, you've got a couple weeks to put it together to, to present it to the editor, then I mean to, to present it to the director. And then you work with the director for 10 weeks and then you present it to the studio. And then you test and revise and test, and it takes at least nine months, sometimes a year, sometimes longer, depending on how many effects. What's that first presentation to the director like? Are you nervous at all, saying, wow, I've been working on this for weeks. This is my own vision uh, for this director's film. What's that like? You've been working on it for months. Yeah, it's, it's, you're presenting your cut of their movie to them. And... Uh, I, I like to go for the gusto and try to present something that actually works. Not, I don't like to string together everything. If something isn't working or if there's a scene that really doesn't need to be in the movie, I, I will usually discuss it with the director during production and say, you know, I just want to present it to you this way without this because I think it works better. You can always put it in if you want. Some editors work differently. They just, they actually show everything that the director shot. Mm. And then it, it's a really, really long first cut and everybody wants to pull out their hair. <laughs> but I try to take out stuff that I know doesn't work or I feel doesn't work. I want to, I want to present a movie that works from beginning to end. So I always have sound effects and music to it before when I'm presenting it to the director. And, you know, it's not the final cut by any means, but it hopefully is a movie with a beginning, middle, and an end. What's, what's been the absolute best reaction? Have you ever had a director say, oh my gosh, that's almost perfect? I've had many compliments on my, on my uh, cuts. And, and then uh, I'm, most of the time the directors are pleasantly surprised. Sometimes... Uh, you know, there are certain directors will, that will just go, oh, we've got a lot of work to do, <laughs> which, yeah, and that's fair because we do, but most of them seem to be happy. I mean, I've had the comment, wow, that's a lot better than I thought it would be, you know, <laughs> which is good. That feels good when you hear that, those words. Uh, what was working with Paul Verhoeven on Showgirls like? That was a great job. Loved working on that. I worked again with my friend Mark Oblad on that. He got the gig. I read about it in the trades and I thought, oh, Paul Verhoeven is doing a NC-17 movie, you know, written by Joe Esterhaus. Oh, I wish I could work on that. And then I found out that Mark got the job. And then during production, like a month into it or, or so, he called me up, he said, we need a nine and a half minute promo cut for can so you want to come and do that i said sure and so i came and cut this promo and because the film wasn't edited yet i was editing scenes and dance scenes and to put this into this promo piece and paul li liked it enough to 
keep me on as another editor. So Mark and I cut the, the film. And it was just, I think Paul's one of the most talented directors ever. He, his directing style is so intelligent. It was one of the easiest films to edit that I've ever experienced because the footage spoke to you. You knew exactly when to go in and go out of every shot. So how does he do that? Just, he knows where to put the camera for whatever action is happening. Uh, you know, or how to capture it in the most effective way, I think. Um, he knows how to move the camera. There's so many shots that are just, you hold on the shot because it works for a long time. You know, as an editor, the tendency for some is to cut as often as you can, but that's not the way I like to work. I like to hold on a shot until I want to see the next shot. It's just an instinctual thing. I, if, if it's playing in one, then just keep that shot playing. Because if it's working, it's working. And with Paul, a lot of things worked. You just wanted to watch it. You were just enthralled. So, Oh, that's cool. I, I just really enjoyed working with him. So tell me about editing comedy. So when you, know, you were then working on Rush Hour, Scary Movie. How does that differ from editing an action film or a drama? Uh, for me, editing, it's the same thing regardless of the genre. I mean, there are, I feel I can edit anything. That, so if it's comedy, I, it's about timing. You know, I, it's about making myself laugh or giggle. Um, with, with drama, it's like, or something that's supposed to be scary. I want to try to jolt myself or scare myself. It's just, it's an instinct of what, is effective. That's that's how I go about it. Um, I love comedy, though. I mean, there's nothing better than being in an audience at a preview of a film that you've worked on and listening to the audience's reaction on a comedy. I mean, to hear them laugh, it's like ah, I did something good. Yeah, I did. It worked, and that's the best feeling. That's my favorite part of editing is the preview process. That's fun. I guess, from what I understand, if you're a comedian or if you're on stage or performer, you, you love the rush of the audience, the applause. Well, I just love to hear an audience react to something I've put together. Yeah. How do you know if something is funny when you're there in, in the dark room alone? Oh, well, when you're watching dailies, if it makes you laugh. Um, on Scary Movie, I think every day... I had no idea what I was going to see because there was so much improv uh, on the set that even though I knew the scenes that they were shooting, I didn't know what I'd see the next day. And I was just in tears every day of laughter just, could be, just because the dailies were so funny. That's great. If I'm laughing at the dailies, I know it's working. All I got to do is pick the best take and put it in, you know? Yeah. And then sometimes you have to manuf if it doesn't work the way it's supposed to work, you know, it was funny on the page, but why isn't that funny, you know, when it's shot, then you have to be a little more creative and try to make it work through reactions or through elongating the timing or contracting the timing or cutting out some of the, the fat just to make something work as a joke. And then sometimes you just have to cut it out because it doesn't work ever. And that's what the testing preview process is about too. If you're previewing a comedy, you can hear the audience. You know if they're enjoying this, this joke or this action. And if there's no reaction to something that was supposed to be funny or that we even thought was funny, then you, you weigh... Yeah, should we keep it in or should we try? First, you try to change it and make it effective. And if it doesn't get a reaction, then and you don't need to keep it, cut it out. You know? Yeah. Uh, what, what were the Wayans brothers like to work with in the editing room? Keenan was great. He was so open to anything. And I would see a scene come in, then I'd call him up and say, you know what would be funny if this happened? He, and he said, well, go shoot it. And so he gave me a second unit to go and shoot things for Scary Movie. 
just because he's so open to he comes from i guess from a television uh writing background where you've got a team of writers and everybody's riffing and coming up with stuff so um if i came up with something that i thought was funny he, he said go shoot it and and we put it in the movie so i love that it's great what resources that did you have could you go get the original actors and oh yeah yeah no i just went to the set and they they gave me a whole second unit with a you know dp everything how fun because i love to direct too so that was it was great anytime i get a chance to to direct second unit or anything i'm i'm there what about working with brett ratner what was like what was that like on the rush hour movies he was great as well he was a newer director in fact i uh, edited all of his movies from the very first one which was money talks since he he came out of commercials and editing money talks which was also a, a comedy that was one of those screenings where when i presented the first cut to him he he just said oh, i made a movie he had no idea <laughs> that it would work but it 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 did work and so he was really excited and we got along and uh um, I love working with him because, you know, we came up with some really funny, funny films. And then I also liked that he didn't stick with one genre. He did other kinds of films, too. So uh, we worked on Red Dragon, and you know, which was, there was nothing funny about that. And, and Family Man, which was really touching. And I, it's one of my favorite movies that I've cut. So... Um, with him, because he was so prolific, it was great to be along for the ride. What other directors have you really enjoyed this, you know, uh, years-long relationship with, where you get to evolve uh, with them? Brett, for one. Uh, I, Craig Baxley, I did uh, a lot of movies with him back in the 80s, and he was a wonderful person to work with. Uh, enjoyed the movies, even though some of the movies weren't the greatest movies, they were a lot of fun to work on. Uh, some of them were, were fun, were great, but uh, others were like, yeah, they're okay. And Jay Kasdan, who I've done the two Jumanji movies with, love working with him. He's really smart and very funny and really knows about editing. He really knows what can be done in the editing room. And uh, we don't rest until we've got something that's working. Cool. What, what, what was working on both Jumanji's? So I did uh, Welcome to the Jungle and uh, The Next Level. Yeah. What, what was that like? Well, that was just a wealth of fantastic performances. Because you've got Kevin Hart and you've got Jack Black and Dwayne Johnson. So, you know, you have all these great comedic moments to choose from. Uh, and there was, of course, a lot of, of ad-libbing on Kevin Hart's part, for sure. So it was like picking the best one. And, and we tested several all the time. So it, it was a wealth of, of choices. So I thought it was a lot of fun. I mean, and plus, I liked the movie. It was a clever script, both of them. How cool. What was working on X-Men, The Last Stand, like? That one was a really difficult film. I had a ball. Again, on that one, I also shot third units because there was already a second unit director. But uh, that particular movie had a release date set in stone. So we had to make that release date. But they started shooting before the script was really done. So... There were constant rewrites as they were shooting, which the movie was in flux and being sort of being made up as they were shooting. And so we would get scenes in and there were three edit, three of us editors on that. It was me and Mark. I brought Mark Goldblatt on uh, to return the favor that he's done to me so many times. And then uh, Julia Wong who was my assistant back a few years earlier. So she graduated to editing and, um, and she's a fantastic editor too. So we were all working furiously, putting this thing together and figuring, oh, well, we need this. Okay, 
well, it's got to be shot. Let's, sometimes we wrote scenes and presented them to the writer who, who tweaked them and then it got shot. Sometimes I had to go and shoot stuff that we needed because there was no time for the first or second unit to shoot it. What's an example? Something that you would go shoot? Uh, like like, what kind of- like uh, when uh, Wolverine was being chased by Spike. That that scene, we made that scene up in the editing room. There was no spike in the in the uh, in the movie in the script. We wow. just needed a mutant. There's a whole uh, mini documentary on the on the Blu-ray about how we did this in the editing room. But there there was a scene where it looked like Wolverine was killing these homeless people for no reason. It just didn't make any sense. So. We thought, well, this is some good footage of him slashing and killing, but there's no reason for him to do it unless he's attacked. So we thought, okay, well, he should be attacked by a mutant. So the writer said, well, look in this Marvel book of all the mutants. This There's a master Marvel book that had mutants. And we thought, ah, okay, this guy's Spike. He can grow spikes out of his arm. And he, okay, well... We'll have well, so we storyboarded that up and presented it, and they said yes, and so that got shot. Wow! So a lot of creativity can happen in the editing room, at not just editing. Sometimes it's writing, and it's always rewriting you know, by juxtapositioning things or moving scenes around. That's that's all part of editing, but. Sometimes it goes further. You can actually suggest things to get shot. Yeah. That's what happened on X-Men The Last Stand a lot. What are you working on now? And I say, what are your, I'd love to know, what are your goals at this stage in your career? What are you, what are you wanting to accomplish? I just, I enjoy work and um, I, I'm about to start another film with Jake Kasdan and Dwayne Johnson. Uh, it's a Christmas movie. And it's, it's, I, the script is fantastic, so I can't wait. And uh, I just want to keep working. I, I like uh, telling stories, whether it's editing or directing. I, I would direct again at the drop of a hat if I get the opportunity, because it's fun too. I just love telling stories through the cinema. How do your uh, directing jobs come to be typically? And how will you make that, bring that next uh, directing project? I don't know how the next one will come to be. I mean, I don't have a script that is being offered to me at the moment, but it's, I just have to be uh, fortunate enough to get offered um, something to direct which if, if I am, I'll probably do it because I enjoy it. Uh, but it's just luck at this point for me because I'm not a writer. If I was a writer and I could write scripts, I said I could say I'd like to direct this, but I'm not. I can rewrite, but I can't write. I, I see. Uh, what, what was directing Good Luck Chuck like? The uh, overwhelming constant for my career I think is it's been fun you know so I every movie that you mention it's been fun so uh, directing Good Luck Chuck was a ball I mean it was a funny script we wanted to make a raunchy sex comedy and and I think we did and it was laughs all the time on the set and again we uh got to the preview and there was nothing better than hearing the audience roar with laughter. So, um, I, you know, I can't say enough good things about, uh, directing comedy because you're having fun on the set and that's as a director, you're watching the acting. And if it makes you laugh, then, you know, it must be working. It's so joyous to actually be on the set and, and, have the actors crack you up. If something's supposed to be funny, that's where you got to go in and direct and try to figure out why it wasn't making you laugh. But I'm, I'm my own barometer for what I think is funny. So. That's great. Well, you have a good barometer. Uh, what, uh, what advice do you have for editors early in their careers hoping to have a career like yours, working on great films? Nowadays, everybody can edit. 
Uh, when I started out, you had to actually be fortunate enough to go to film school or own some equipment to edit or be working on a movie. Now everybody's got a camera in their phone and everybody's got editing software. So people, if you want to edit, you can do it. Just do it now. You can take things, you can re-edit movies or videos that you find. You don't even have to shoot anything. You can re-edit and just show how you can edit. So um, my advice to anybody who wants to edit is to do it and, and find people who shoot videos, make television shows, movies, and try to work with them. I mean, if you find, find somebody who wants to be a filmmaker as well and you want to be the editor, do it. And that's the only advice I can give is to do it, show your work to people. I mean, because you can get really good by practicing, by editing. What do you think is the value of film school nowadays? For me, even in the bygone days, it was the film history, just getting all, all that knowledge um, and I think today it's the same thing. There's even more film history because <laughs> there's more film. <laughs> um, and I think there's specialized um, schools like AFI, USC, and those are fantastic. Uh, Chapman, there's so many really good filmmaking schools now. So if you're lucky enough to get in those, then you've got a real good head start. Uh, but uh, I don't think it is necessary in order to work in the industry. You just have to be lucky enough to know somebody who's, who's working in it and get offered a job. Yeah. But that's why if you're, you're already, if you already have a craft like editing, if you've already done that, you can volunteer to do that and, and already be there. Yeah. That's great. Already be skilled, I mean. Well, um, Mark, this was great. Is there anything else uh, that might be interesting to, to touch on while, while I have you? I'm a member of American Cinema Editors, which is a honorary uh, society of motion picture editors. It was founded in 1950. The um, ACE is where all the really good editors uh, end up. And ACE is a great uh, organization because we not only have a great internship program, uh, I think it's probably the best in the business if you want to be an editor. There's uh, hundreds of applicants, but only two are chosen every year, just two. And those two with 100% uh, success rate, they are working in the business. Uh, we also have student editing competitions and we got the Eddie Awards, um, fellowships, and and uh, we are trying to make the invisible art of editing more visible. I'm trying to enhance the reputation and prestige and, and the recognition of our art. So uh, I'm just a big proponent of American Cinema Editors. That's wonderful. How can viewers or listeners of this podcast learn more about ACE? How can they try to eventually join it? Do you guys produce events that people can attend? Yes, there's uh, online events and in-person events. Um, so we've got uh, quite a, we've got Edit Fest coming up, uh, well, every year, but this summer coming up uh, this next month. You can go to AmericanCinemaEditors.org and all the information is there. What is Edit Fest? It's a great place for not only editors, but wannabe editors or anybody interested in editing to learn about the craft because there's going to be panels of editors talking about whatever the subject is that year. And there's many panels per year. So you actually get to uh, hear some of the famous editors talking about their craft and talking with uh, each other and being interviewed and it's a it's a real ball it's a lot of fun and i highly recommend it i will definitely go that sounds awesome and anybody can, yeah anybody can go it's it, now that it's online you don't have to be in person uh it is an in-person event but 
they're also streaming. So. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, well, Mark, this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, learned a lot. Can't wait to, to make this live and can't wait to see your upcoming films. Okay, edit it. Make, make me look good. <laughs> Put a filter on or something. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Goodbye.